So rather than do a uh, full user research presentation on all of the user research in Destiny, we just wanted to do a straight up Q&A and let people ask questions, and uh, we'll give you answers. So Jennifer just talked, and she owned, and I actually would like you go ahead and introduce the general areas of the game you owned. Sure. So the general areas I owned for Destiny launch was the combatants, uh, the social spaces, the web and mobile, and the art teams. I'm uh, Nick Hillier. Uh, I cover data logging, sandbox investment, PVP, UI, initial experience. Anything else? No. Yeah. Uh, I think that was it. Uh, and I'm John Hobson. I was the user research lead for Destiny, and I owned everything else, and sort of was the grab bag uh, ke uh, pinch hitter for everything. Uh, who has a question? Oh, oh Jordan. Yeah. So let's talk the crypt dark. Yes. So can you He's walk us, there. so for anyone who's not familiar with Destiny, the product, <laughs> there was an issue with the loot tables and the loot system where many players were dissatisfied with the random generation of loot. Can you talk to us about how that went in playtesting and what led to the eventual changes that are the Destiny loot system we know today? So the Cryptarch, uh, well, actually, you want to talk about this since this is your, your problem? Go ahead. No. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll, I, I I'll do the general. Oh, fine. Uh, the, the general issue was that you killed a mob, it would drop a, an engram, which is a little sort of geometric shape that was colored by the general quality of what was inside. And there were white engrams, green engrams, uh, blue, purple, and yellow, I think. Um, with increasing levels of quality, the problem was that what was in it was not always the same color as the item. So a green engram, in general, dropped a green item, but every once in a while it would drop a blue item, and every once in a while it would drop a white item. And th that was, part, for us, part of the randomness. It was a sort of general indicator, but it might be better, it might be worse. But people got incredibly frustrated when their legendary engrams gave them a non-legendary item. They were just incredibly pissed. And so we didn't actually change the drops themselves at all. We just changed the color of the engram to match what was inside. It was it, it, we, we said, okay, you're gonna get much fewer purple engrams, but when you do, they will always give you a purple item. People tend to be happier with that. Okay. But it was more of a, we, and this was, I think, a case where it didn't happen enough in internal testing. People didn't play the game long enough to get really angry at it. <laughs> it, it there were also bigger issues that, were more more important, and if we were going to kind of spend our ability to make changes, that was lower on the priority. So it didn't really come up until until we shipped, and people, yeah, they had really put the time in to a character they wanted to keep, and they got upset. I would also hold this up as one of those examples <coughs> where internal knowledge sort of betrayed us that we knew that they were supposed to be random, and that we knew that there was sort of a general indicator, and the players didn't know that. They thought what it said in the box is what they were supposed to get. And they just took it a lot more seriously and a lot, they, they thought that was a contract. Yeah. And so we said, okay, we didn't tell them they were wrong, we actually said, okay, it, it's a contract now. <laughs> what it says is what you get. Yeah, because it was labeled in earlier builds as the game, the gambler, right? Yes, I mean, the Cryptarch's original name was the gambler. So we all looked at it and kind of knew what it was. <laughs> um, what was your guys' uh, method for collaboration between the various user research sections on Destiny? Um, we all sit together. We all talk frequently about it. Um, I don't know that we had any specific methods of other than, you know, keeping in touch with each other quite a bit. And kind of, you know, figuring out for each study which was the important thing that we wanted to cover in that content. So, like, combatants were in a lot of them, but sometimes we would do more focused studies and just talking out. Talking out to see what the build was going to be focused on and what the playtest was going to be focused on was an important part. Was there a fair amount of like, crosswork between the stuff that you were working on? It seems like combatants could be impacted and vice versa, impact other things that were going on. Yes. Yeah, there were, and that's where the reporting and kind of sharing those reports was an important factor. Yeah. It was huge and it was very challenging. I mean, and, and everyone played remarkably nice. Because um, <laughs> especially because it's like, okay, if Nick's owning UI and Jen's owning combatants, well, who owns a UI feature that tells you what the combatant strengths are. And everybody played remarkably nice and I'm amazingly uh, impressed with all. So Destiny was a, gosh, this is loud. Who's talking? Destiny was a, a big gamble for Bungie in terms of you had a lot riding on the, the project. What were the, the big open questions before launch that research was helping to inform? 
Like, what were the, the anxieties and how did you guys work within that? Hmm. Major ones, I'm talk about. Um, I mean, the, the major ones that, I mean, that we help with, uh, we help with questions like, how, I mean, how much are people gonna play the game? It's like, okay, how many hours a week are people gonna play and therefore, how fast should we give them loot to give them a reasonable amount of loot per week? There are a lot of those kind of questions, which actually we turned out to be completely wrong on. Um, our players are remarkably fanatic. Uh, but, I mean, we in hopefully informed every aspect of the game design. We tested pretty much everything. Um, yeah, from the sandbox perspective, I mean, I know class balance was a huge issue and there were a lot of concerns around the studio around class balance and overall that worked out quite well. Um, having supers in the game and how that was going to um, impact PvP um, was a big open question. I think another um, thing was the social spaces was something that was of question. People yeah. didn't know how much they would go to them and how much they would get used to patrols. Um, and that was something that was an open question to see how would it compare from lab, lab studies to real life. Were you able, when you were doing your tests, were you able to do highly specialized sort of focus testing for things like colorblindness or or deafness, maybe uh, fine motor impairment, things like that? Uh, well, Funny you should ask. Yeah, uh, we just approached the colorblindness uh, question recently. Um, a lot of that was more done at an internal level, um, just because we didn't really want to get involved with health issues with participant information. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of the concern. Um, and just uh, we could get a quick analysis and feedback to the teams regarding that. So that's one thing we have approached. Um, other than that, I think we just kind of kept to the... Uh, motion sickness was the other oh, yeah. one that I'll throw in. Um, in the UI. Uh, yeah, I mean, John can... Yeah. <laughs> so my, I think my first actual study on Destiny was uh, we have a feature in the UI of having... Uh, What's it, what's it? Counter, uh, counter scrolling. Yeah, counter scrolling. That they have, you have multiple layers of trans, semi transparency, and as you scroll across the UI, they'll shift over each other. And I first, and I first watched this, and I'm like, oh, I feel a little queasy. Um, okay, let's find everybody in the studio who's subject to motion sickness, and let's get them all to watch a couple of sample videos of different ways we could handle counter scrolling and how much counter scrolling. Um, and we were able to say, yes, okay, this is affecting some people. Here's the parameters for which, which this is safe and isn't going to make people vomit. Um, that, that's a new low bar for me. I'm, like the minimal level for success for a UI is does not make anyone throw up. <laughs> Actually, we, and on we hit that bar. Same issue on the, uh, with the, we call it the free cursor, kind of the, the UI cursor that you move around the screen. That was another big thing that um, the studio was worried about. How would people be able, would people be able to use that? How would they use it? That kind of thing. And we put it in the lab, and it was just immediately like, yeah, works, no problem, you know. And other than the counter scroll cool. issue, the first time we saw the design box on that, we were like convinced this is going to be a huge issue. Yeah, because it's just no one does free cursors in console games for good reason, and it's been a complete non-issue. It's yeah. been like people figured it out, used it happily. <laughs> we were wrong. Yeah. Oh, uh, who has a mic? Oh. How do you guys, as it transitioned from? early small set of users, more users, and then after launch, like billions of users, how did you guys keep track of the user base, figure out which issues to focus on, and then how to triage into diving deeper into them um, over time? We logged a lot of data. <laughs> um, yeah, and our, our logging stayed relatively consistent. We were building it as we were building the game, but um, we had data logging from a very early stage in the game and we were able to follow u users all the way through alpha, beta, and whatnot and into release and, and knew the data well. Did you guys have any beta games or how did you, what was the cadence where that was brought into usefulness? Uh, mostly we're using, we're, cho we're choosing our priorities based on what the team's working on. If they're already, if they're all working on missions this week, we were trying to give them feedback that was related to that. And so we were sort of hitting hopefully hitting the issues that were approximate in their minds at the time. Yeah. So one of the big things about Destiny is you can play with people you know, or you can play potentially with people you don't know, right? And Or you can play alone, and those are very different experiences. And when we're talking about combatant difficulty, it can be completely different levels of difficulty depending on, on whether you're playing with other people. So what was kind of the standard experience you guys tested with? And then if it didn't include playing with other people, how did you kind of tackle that? 
So we did do some studies that were fire team studies where we would pair people together when they came into the lab and saw how that changed the balance of the game. Um, that was one way we approached kind of adjusting for different player amounts. Um, and then did those people know each other like when they came to the lab or were you playing with kind of like randos? Most of them were randos. Yeah, we, were yeah. trying to we were trying yeah. to simulate the, the public matchmaking experience in Destiny. The, I hit the rock uh, strike button and you match me with two other people and go. We were trying to simulate that. It, the, the social aspect, uh, like going into the tower when you're with you know, lots of people, that was hard to simulate when the entire studio was playing, just because people are off doing different things. And we, in the lab, we tried on several occasions to do it, and it just never really worked out, just because people, they bounce around too much, and all getting in the same instance in the tower just rarely happened. Uh, way in the back? Oh. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, this one, not earlier, but I'm curious, um, you talked about not catching the issue with the crypt arc because you didn't have uh, players play that long or that much in your tests. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how did you did you use play testing in order to uh, help balance sort of the longitudinal aspect, like how long it would take to get to levels? Um, did you have studies that went over long periods of time to see how players change their opinion or use of the game? Are you? Um, <clears throat> so we mostly tested. Uh, until they cl completed the story. Um, we had talked about in development wanting to do uh, longer term panel studies where we bring people back uh, you know, over, over the course of weeks or months. Um, and we never got there and the primary reason was that it wouldn't have been useful. The, the game had changed so much um, in two weeks that we couldn't have brought people back and had them retain their characters and gotten useful data out of it. The designers would have ignored it. Sorry, did you, did you um, ever provide the designers with feedback on the amount of time it would take to reach levels or to get certain loot? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And yeah, mm -hmm. we, were, we were absolutely looking at that. Um, my favorite tool for that was there was a, uh, we basically made the Facebook game version of Destiny where you could just sort of click on what they called mock where you could just sort of basically say, I want to do this, set this mission, and then an enemy would pop up in the middle of the screen, you'd click on him, he'd die, and they'd pop up at a, st at a, a predetermined rate. So it would take you about the same amount of time to go through a mission, but nothing moved around and you didn't have to aim or anything. And sort of getting a sense of, okay, I have to do five missions to get this many drops, and this takes this long, and so on. It actually simulated out the experience pretty well. About, um, you were talking about enemy combatants and uh, picking their weak spots, mm -hmm. and how the four different combatant factions have kind of like different ideas on how to approach them. Um, what's the idea between behind Fogoth's weakness being on his stomach? Just didn't it didn't that, click for anybody that I spoke that, with and I play with. That was more of an evolution of the character, I would say. Um, trying to, I don't know that. I don't know that I was there for that decision point at that point. We were still, that was earlier, I think. But um, I think it was mostly a strategy thing. And the bosses and majors are a different situation than the combatant types. Um, those are kind of special cases where they were allowed to have kind of a different tactic to approach them. Um, and that's what led to different combatant majors and ultras having some maybe different weak points. Uh, but overall, we wanted kind of a trend across. Kind of related to that, in a more general sense, did you have any issues um, with people coming in with ex certain expectations about how to approach an FPS, like weak points? Weak points are always yeah. going to be the head. Yes. I noticed <laughs> three out of the four kind of factions generally, like the head's the right way to go. Yeah, um, yeah. We actually had, and we had uh, some combatants early on had different weak points that weren't their head or their belly. And uh, that was a point of confusion. And some of those weak points were. Uh, were standardized so that way they were no longer, the player had to kind of hunt them out and figure them out. Um, if it was obvious, it was fine. Um, but for some of the examples, like the Cabal didn't always have a headshot. 
Um, and so that was something that if it wasn't indicated and they were having a player and it didn't fit the fiction, we were like, well, then why are we forcing it? Um, and so that's when you know you, you reassess how important is that weak spot to not be where it is and where players expect, and then what do you do about that? Um, so it ultimately comes down to both a design and a data situation. Like they're having problems, what do you want to do? Um, and then working with design to figure out like, well, maybe it's character art that we need to approach, and like to what level, what level of importance is it? So it's a that not necessarily, that's more of a design decision overall and how do you inform each other to make that decision. Thank you. Um, so Destiny was one of the first game, well, first game that Bungie's put out with aim down sights, but mm -hmm. Destiny's a game that's also quite a lot about movement and jumping around and everything like that. Did you have a problem balancing that? Because when you're aiming down sights, people don't want to move, like it's kind of, stand still and shoot, or was that not a problem? Uh, we didn't have any particular problem with it, no. Um, it, yeah, I think that's, yeah. I don't know. I mean, aim down size was intended to sort of help the players, that it's a, okay, you hit the button, okay, now you're in aiming mode, you're moving slower, not to hurt you, but to actually make it easier to aim. And so it was intended as a benefit. And mostly seems to have worked out that way. And uh, if I can just ask one more question, yep. I have a bunch, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Disney is, is quite interesting in terms of being an, a quite an open world game, but it has no map. Was there ever a map? Was that something that was ever considered, or was it just something that was like you were going to go without a map and you wanted to support that? It was debated a fair amount. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why and why not to have it, and it just and, and the scale ended up tipping to the no map <laughs> side. There's certainly arguments for having one. Oh, oh, somebody <laughs> all the way. Yeah. Take was on the clever sort of UI stuff that came out of the community afterwards, where they made some interesting fixes on lesson selection and stuff like that that were really, I thought, innovative on, on the system that you guys had already built. Uh, what, what would you guys take? I'm, no, I'm not sure what specific ones you're talking about. Uh, I know that the Reddit the Destiny community like made some mock ups for quick weapon switching and for making weapon sets that you could swap in and out very quickly that seemed to uh, address small issues that really hardcore players were having in a really clever way to fit with the UI. Did you guys even look at that, or was that something that you considered, or that you, uh, that you spoke about with the team, or is it, is it just like, cool, thanks for the whatever? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, <clears throat> our UI designer, our, our main, our lead UI designer is, looks at that stuff quite a bit, and he spends quite a bit of time looking at it. And some of that stuff that came out was proposed and mocked up prior to shipping, and it didn't work out for whatever whatever reason, like we, we chose to go a different route. So um, yeah, they're, they're on top of things, certainly, in terms of what the community's doing. Questions? Yes, oh, oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, Steven, you may. Yeah, you, because you haven't asked a question yet, go. Sure. Um, you guys mentioned about your, when you were dealing with like combatants not being able to see very easily sometimes. Um, and you, you mentioned all the different teams that were uh, sort of notified of that issue. How do you um, potentially deal with it when like all the teams have different solutions to the problem? Um, it's getting them all in the same room and talking. Um, it really, <laughs> it really comes down to. So a lot of what came down to like when I got combatants, I was like, oh, this will just be you know looking at data and reporting on how things are going. But a lot of it became a communication understanding yeah. of how do we bring these teams together for things that are important. I mean, they were talking before. But just like, how do we bring data and who do I need to talk to to inform in the right direction? So a lot of it became understanding how to work with the teams. And since everyone does have their hands, like even within our team, we had our hands in everything and the same works for design. So it's just understanding who to talk to. Sure. Question, there's a question back? Yeah. There's three questions. Uh, I already asked a question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was curious how much you try to empower design to do their own research. Like, do they dig into tracking on their own and sort of watch the, the daily reports, or do you have to like call stuff out and take it to them and say, like, this is a thing you need to care about? I'm not sure I define that as doing their own research. Them doing their own research sounds dangerous. Um, <laughs> we certainly give them as much access to data as possible and let them run around, um, and it varies by team. Some designers watch everything and read everything, and some of them just want us to tell us tell them the three bullet points. Uh, there's somebody else over here? Oh. 
So with a, a project of the length of Destiny, there's probably a bunch of stuff that you wish you could have done but, but did not do from a research standpoint, or problems that post-launch you wish you could have approached differently from a research standpoint. Is there anything that you would do differently from how you were investigating or how you were tracking or, or things you wish you could have looked into via different methods that you would do if you could do it over? Um, <laughs> I mean, there certainly are a few rough points that I wish we'd uh, paid more attention to. Uh, the transition to the end game, I think, was a section that we missed. Uh, when you switch from leveling up through experience points to leveling up through gear, was we knew it was an issue. Uh, certainly we did some studies on it, but we didn't get it ironed out enough beforehand. Um, let's see, other stuff. I think the reaction to the first Iron Banner uh, surprised us quite a bit and was contradicted our user yeah. research results pretty hard. Actually, I'll let you talk about, because we, uh, we did some studies with power and PVP and universally it was hated. And it wasn't, it wasn't that person killed me, I'm level 18, that person killed me, it was level 20, okay, that, that's okay, I understand why. It was, screw you, Bungie, you put me in a game with that guy. <laughs> and it's your fault he killed me. And they were just incredibly angry about it. And suddenly, then we did, we had the first Iron Banner in the real world, we had a power matter a little tiny bit, and people were like, this doesn't matter enough, I want this to hurt more. Hmm. It's like, okay. <laughs> that was the general player base, was we, we wanted power to matter. I want to be crushed by people who are 10 levels above me. It's like, okay, okay, we can do that. <laughs> okay, uh, last one, I think. Uh, yeah, question. Um, so the Vault of Glass and Crow to Zen, the two raids, they kind of were very different in that they were experiences where it felt like you were just go figure it out. If you go bang, bong your he uh, bunk your head on things, so be it. Was there much in the way of user research testing that went into those, given that it was almost like go figure it out on your own? Um, or did you guys just kind of turn people loose and like, let's see what happens? Uh, we did some user research testing. We brought in uh, an entire shooter clan to come and test it, uh, test the raids and things like that. But by and large, the raid team does what they want to do. Um, that, I mean, it's intended to be hard. It's intended to be difficult to figure out. It, it sort of violates most of the basic principles of user research. Yeah, that's uh, and sort of a safety valve for the team that we spend a lot of time telling them, no, you can't do this, it's too hard. No, this is confusing, you have to change your design. Having one experience where they get to make things arbitrarily hard and brutal is sort of nice for them, therapeutic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Anything else? Okay, yeah. last question? Okay, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna try not to eat the mic too much, just enough. Um, obviously, this is a problem for everyone industry-wide, but I know Bungie's been orienting around this ever since you guys started planning Destiny. How did mentally prepping for the difference between a ship-and-forget game to an always-on game get integrated into your labs? And I apologize, I got here late, but that super easy yeah. question has already been covered. No, no, um, I'm not sure we have a good answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure we have mentally fully adjusted yet. It, I mean, Especially because Bungie in particular took great pride in the fact that their games didn't need <laughs> ongoing support. Like it was a, it was a, something people bragged about that we didn't have day one or week one patches. Mm -hmm. It's that the game we shipped was so rock solid and so well balanced and no crashing bugs and that we could fire it and really forget it. And that was something they bragged about. And now we have to, we're paying attention all the time and we're tweaking things all the time and we're highly engaged. It's been a shock. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.